joining us for this uh, special webinar presentation. Before we do anything else, I want to introduce the wonderful Andy Dye Kerr, um, also known as Professor Diane Kerr at the University of Melbourne, who is going to welcome us to country. Thanks, Andy Dye. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you so much. You are very close to our hearts as well. Um, Emma Perricky wants to thank you himself, so I'm going to invite him to do that now. Thank you. Um, o te Wurundjeri, um, a nei nā mihi ki te uh, iwi Wurundjeri i raruna huatango o te wā nei. Tātou ka tōnau mai, um, hei āta kōrero, hei āta wānanga, hei āta whakawhiti whakāro um, kia au mātou ki te oranga nui tana uh, o mātou nei we take take o te ao. Uh, Tauri i tēnā ka tukumihi atu a hau um, kia Aunt Diane um, o, o uh, mihi um, kia tau mai mātou uh, hei whakatau mai mātou i runga i tō uh, whenua i tēnei rangi uh, nā te um, nōku nei um, te honore nui uh, kia au mai ki tēnei te whare wānanga o piripono uh, ki te uh, mahi ki ēnei te momo mahi nō re rā nei aku mi ki ākoe. Um, first of all, I just wanted to pay, um, um, give um, reference um, to those who have um, gone before us, those who have returned to the place from where we can. Um, may you sleep in peace. Um, those of us who are the living, um, welcome um, to the seminar. Most of all, I would like to take this opportunity to um, say thank you um, to the one Wurundjeri people. Um, for their hospitality towards me um, on this day and to Auntie Diane um, for her lovely words, which I totally and absolutely support. Um, and for, to the University of Melbourne who have provided us um, with this space. Um, I just wanted to also take this opportunity um, to um, thank um, the elders of past, um, of present, of future, of the Wurundjeri people. Kia ora. Thank you. Thank you. That's wonderful. Thank you, Hema Periki. I'm going to introduce uh, Hema Periki and Lorenzo more fully in a moment. Um, but first, just a couple of technical um, rules for the day. So as always with our webinars, uh, we ask you to use the Q&A function to ask your questions uh, at the end of, um, of the conversation that Lorenzo and Hema Periki are about to have. Um, the chat function is disabled, um, but we do really want to hear from you. So, so don't be shy. We often get to the end of these and people hold back a little and I get to ask some interesting questions, but um, we'd love to hear from you today. Um, so uh, please, please do do that. And uh, closed captioning is available. Um, so I'm now going to move straight to introducing our presenters. So we're very lucky today to have with us Hema Pariki Hawani Simon, who is a Māori from uh, Tuwharetoa, Te Aroa, Te Nui, Hauraki, Matatua, um, uh, Iwi, who is a, a scholar, is a scholar who's an honorary Indigenous Research Fellow at the Centre for Indigenous and Settler Colonial Studies. His academic background is very diverse and he self-identifies as a very interdisciplinary and critical researcher who specialises in kaupapa Māori research. Hema Pariki holds a Master's of Philosophy in Resource and Environmental Planning from Massey University and from the University of Waikato, a Bachelor of Arts with Honours in Indigenous Studies and a Bachelor of Māori and Pacific Development. More recently, Hema Pariki was the first Māori scholar to be awarded a Research Justice at the Intersection Research Fellow at Mills College in California. He's also a former Pure Huroa Scholar, um, and it is expected that he should graduate with a PhD in interdisciplinary Indigenous politics in 2023. 
His doctoral research deals with the intersection of mana motuhake, indigenous sovereignty, settler colonialism, and the white possessive, the Treaty of Waitangi, and the collective future of Aotearoa, New Zealand. Um, Emma Pareki has a significant environmental and indigenous policy and governance background, and he is based on his occupied ancestral lands in Taupo in Aotearoa, New Zealand. And today, Hema Paraki will be in conversation with the wonderful Associate Professor Lorenzo Verrocini, who is an Honorary Senior Fellow at the Australian Centre with us and teaches history and politics at Swinburne University of Technology. His research focuses on the comparative history of colonial systems and settler colonialism as a mode of domination. He has authored Israel and Settler Society in 2006, Settler Colonialism, a Theoretical Overview in 2010, The Settler Colonial Present in 2015, and most recently, The World Turned Inside Out, Settler Colonialism as a Political Idea, published last year. Lorenzo has also co-edited the Routledge Handbook of the History of Settler Colonialism in 2016 and manages the Settler Colonial Studies blog, and he's a founding editor of Settler Colonial Studies. So thank you both. I'm going to... Uh, disappear myself and leave you to what will be a very interesting conversation. I'll be back at the end of that to facilitate some questions from our audience. Wonderful. Um, Hemo Perike, it's great to be here. It's great that you are here. And, um, and, um, and, and I think our conversation will be especially productive because um, um, it's going to fill a gap, what I think it's a gap. It's going to provide um, um, a comparative transnational uh, um, view on, on themes that are debated intensely in public debate in Australian settings. So um, when we met and we, we, we organized our, our, our conversation, we, we touched on the themes that we wanted to, to, to outline. We, 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 we decided that um, the, the best way to, 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 to start was to, to provide a, a comparative perspective on, 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 on what's affecting us, what's, uh, what's, what's interesting uh, in particular to, to, to an Australian audience. So mm. we decided to begin with treaty and sovereignty. So um, if we take this first from an Aotearoa New Zealand perspective, um, in 1835 there was a document that was signed by a bunch of mainly northern rangatira called Hefakabutanga, which is generally in English um, referred to as the Declaration of Independence. This actually created a nation state of Māori, particularly in the northern um, area of the North Island. Um, but the key thing of this is that it affirmed by the British crown that Māori, the, particularly those that signed, held sovereignty to that area. And so if we bring it forward five more years to 1840, there was a treaty um, signed. It was in two different um, languages, one in English, one in um, Te Reo Māori, uh, but they don't speak to one another. Um, so therein um, lies um, a problem there. But what was um, um, thought of at the time was that this was a treaty that ultimately would control um, lawless set, um, colonial settlers, um, particularly in a place like Kororareka or Russell, which was the first um, capital of New Zealand. And so as a part of this uh, much wider conversation, um, more broadly in Australia, uh, Victoria is currently undertaking a uh, modern treaty process. But also I look at um, what has taken place in places like Canada with the idea of a modern treaty and what has happened and transpired there um, within the last 30, 40 years is that they signed a treaty, but the literature seems to highlight the point that it doesn't particularly really work very well. And so one of the things that I do note is that Australia and New Zealand um, Canada have a tendency on some level to recycle each other's Indigenous policy. And even if they fail, um, all the um, policy itself um, is not really as productive as what it's first thought. I think that's a really good um, backgrounding um, conversation uh, for us to have. But within that, in the last 40, 50 years, 
um, in New Zealand, uh, there has been a big push um, towards the idea of biculturalism and towards the idea that the treaty is a founding document. Um, and that's something that um, has, is being challenged, particularly by um, scholars like me, in that in 2014, um, there was a large paradigm shift um, by where the Waitangi Tribunal, um, if you don't know the Waitangi Tribunal, it's New Zealand's version of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, it was the first one in the whole entire world, and it was geared towards acknowledging um, um, grievances that um, Hapu and Iwi, or nation, Indigenous nations and clans had against the Treaty of Waitangi, in particular the New Zealand government. Um, and that paradigm shift was basically the Waitangi Tribunal said that if you sign the Treaty of Waitangi or the Te Tiriti of Waitangi, the Māori version, um, you still maintained Manamotu Hake or Indigenous sovereignty. So a big, huge and shift um, in thinking there. I believe New Zealand is kind of like Australia on one hand and Hawaii on the other. On one hand, uh, you know, the doctrine of discovery is enacted and on the other hand, you're invaded. But there's this myth that's there that, you know, Māori signed the treaty as some homogenous group of people who actually existed. Is that enough background? <laughs> um, it is. It is background indeed. Um, and um, and um, what, what strikes as, as, as especially pertinent is uh, the distinction you are making between uh, an historical treaty mm. and its um, contemporary enactment um, and um, and uh, and modern day treaties, um, and um, it is important to to note that um, we we can rely on both sets of experiences. And um, you mentioned Canada, um, and um, and uh, and um, perhaps some. It would be interesting if you if you were to to to, to comment on um, on the reasons why. Um, Australian public debate is 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 not relying on this body of experience that comes from elsewhere in um, in 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 the world in the history of indigenous settler relations. I think a lot of that has to do with the academy itself. You know, if it's taken as an extension of what I just um, said, um, if the Waitangi Tribunal came out and said this, then there has been no. Um, academic analysis at that point um, that talks about um, Hapu and Iwi that did not sign that document. So you have um, Indigenous nations in New Zealand who still maintain Manamotu Hake or their own Indigenous sovereignty today. But the same thing happened in Canada in the realisation that, you know, if you have no um, the agreement with Indigenous people, that there needed to be some type of Indigenous agreement um, made. Um, and, you know, they called it a modern treaty. Um, and one of the things um, about that is um, the relationship between Canada and Aotearoa New Zealand was that we kind of imported each other's kind of um, policy in and around that. Although we don't call it a modern treaty in New Zealand, we call it a treaty settlement. Um, there's um, comparisons um, between the two as, you know, um, as an example, Naito, which is the iwi um, in, for the majority of the South Island, um, they were claiming to the government that uh, you, they, the government actually owed them over $16 billion at the time, and that freaked out policymakers and all the things. So we ended up importing ideas from Canada, which came about um, the fiscal envelope policy, which restricted um, the amount that could be paid out or compensated um, to Māori uh, for the wrongs of the government in the past. But why I highlight the academy is because the hiring practices of academy, we don't have um, enough Indigenous political scientists or people who are critical enough in these spaces producing research that would examine not only some type of transnational um, way of being, but also to be reflectively critical um, of, you know, national orientated politics and what Indigenous politics 
could be and we don't have enough of that conversation going on right so not enough of that conversation and the issue of um, what treaties who treaties leave out and what treaties leave out mm. which naturally sort of um leads us into 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 touching on a, on on another of the themes that we 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 identified for this conversation which is sovereignty um and um um so my question is is can sovereignty be addressed by way of a treaty um my um orientation towards that question is probably no and the reason being is that if you sign a treaty in a modern context you know you're on some level you're there's a move towards inclusion but when that's where voice to parliament or biculturalism comes in there's a move towards um, inclusion if you move towards more inclusion you actually end up compromising on the sovereignty end of things and so it's kind of an interesting thing because even most research in the last couple of weeks i read something on the northwest passage in relation to canada um there's claims that canada or Aotearoa, or new zealand or australia gained sovereignty um, by the original sovereignty or what i call mana motuhake that pre-existed um, on you know indigenous lands um, and so there's that idea that one can't exist without the other. What I am hopeful of, or what I'm coming more to know, is the idea of re um, re relationality. Um, and how do we understand one another? How do we get on um, thing? Because treaty ultimately, on some level, no matter how you do it, will always perpetuate the nation state and its sovereignty. Whereas Manamotuhake as a form of indigenous sovereignty is different again. And I would always argue, particularly for Aotearoa New Zealand, that Manamotuhake needs to be recognised and provided for. What that looks like is a bit up in the air at the moment, but you know, these are the type of conversations that we do really need to start having. So um in an Australian context and in a Victorian context, you 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 would know that um, um, treaty and sovereignty are um, mm. uh, are very much um, um, a current topic. Would you would you like to comment on um, on what um, um, an Australian public debate may gain from a, from an international insight, from well, your insight? Well, actually, if they were to take into account say what's happening in New Zealand, what's happening in Canada, what's happening in Brazil or wherever, um, you know, what does that look like? It can actually make the outcome more informed. It can actually make the outcome far more robust if they've taken account of things that have taken place overseas. Now, as an example, say voice to parliament. Um, one of the things when I first learned about um, Voice to Parliament immediately um, that I noticed was that its fundamentals are very much like the um, Indigenous inclusion, inclusion Policy um, framework from the 80s in Aotearoa New Zealand, which it was called biculturalism. Um, and so more recently, I published a journal article which calls biculturalism a zombie concept, something that is dead, um, has failed, but has um, kept alive in order to maintain the current power structure. Um, and so in New Zealand, we need to transform that. Um, it, understanding what is taking place elsewhere stops people from continuing um, the idea of just, let's import this great idea from Canada because it happens to be and hopefully it will work. Because what it seems to me with, say, voice to parliament is that you're import, um, importing what has taken place in Aotearoa, New Zealand. But also with voice to parliament um, as well, um, you know, it doesn't meet a human rights standard. 
Um, but even within that, even if it did meet a human rights standard, you know, human rights themselves are mainly about, um, you know, the state taking away um, the position or, of, you know, morality from Indigenous people and making them look good by providing them with rights. Um, and so everything in this space is a conversation. Everything in this space um, has contradiction. Everything in this space requires us to talk things through. Although, you know, I view, as an example, voice to parliament as being a step um, in, you know, something um, much more bigger that could um, take place. I'm reminded of, um, in Aotearoa, New Zealand, um, a major uh, report um, called Matike Mai Aotearoa. Um, and within that report, it talks mainly about the idea of constitutional transformation. Instead of this idea of always implementing constitutional reform, because if we implement something like voice to parliament, which is now going for a referendum, which is beyond me, because the racism exists, you know, the racism is never going to let go. The political system is built on that racism. Um, Indigenous people will never um, advance, um, even if there's a viewed way forward like voice to parliament. I just think that we need to have a lot more conversations amongst ourselves, um, not just Indigenous peoples here in Australia, but amongst ourselves as Indigenous people around the globe. Okay, so um, we need um, um, the, the, the insight that comes from, 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 from an international uh, approach and um and your um your, your general point is that um sovereignty is um is um is is something that cannot uh, be addressed by treaty um and um nonetheless there are possibilities in 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 developing a constitutional practice hmm. and and that sort of leads us onto the what, what, what is possibly the the um, what I believe is uh, is one of the greatest um, um, sort of um, um, ways in which indigenous knowledge can inform constitutional practice. And you 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 work, you've been working on 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 eco constitutionalism. Mm. And um, so um, my my questions are um, you know um, how does eco constitutionalism works and how is that entwined with indigenous settler relations? Okay, so just basically eco constitutionalism. I'll just explain this one first. Um, is where we put the environment at the center of everything that we are. And so one of the key examples that has been bandied around the place in the last few years is Te Watipua or the um, treaty settlement process um, or the settlement of those grievances um, by where the government made um, the Whanganui River a legal person. Now, for English law, this is huge. Um, they took the idea of a corporate legal person and applied it um, to a river on some level. Now, the inherent problem with that is that they've made it a legal person. So technically, you can sue the river. I don't know how successful you would be, but it could be done. But within that is the idea of what is not being talked about. And that's the thing of, while we may have made the river a legal person, and this form of legislation has been copied in places like India um, and all over the place, um, no one's actually talking about the invisible fence. There's a fence there, you know, it exists, it's invisible, you can't see it. But down both sides of the river um, is a fence. And in that fence, what it talks about is colonial or settler colonial, settler invader colonial um, possibility. And the fact that it doesn't address a wider environmental um, issues on a larger scale like extraction and you know intensive agriculture and what purpose the legal person has because if we took the idea 
um, of tikanga or Māori law, uh, Māori custom, Māori way of doing things. It wouldn't be the river that would be made the legal person. It would be Papa Tuanuku that would be made the legal person. Papa Tuanuku being Earth Mother. Um, and because we have settler colonial economies all based on the land that has developed ever since 1840 or whenever you date, whatever date you want to use, you know, we're never going to see a form of eco-constitutionalism, say like Bolivia, Ecuador, where they have put Pachimama as the center of um, their constitutional or their constitutional being. So we've still got a lot of work, but, you know, even within that, if we were to have a look at what I've termed in my work, the collective future, what our country should be based on, other um, base cultures that, you know, invaders, settlers found here in the first place. Um, and so in Aotearoa, New Zealand, there's an argument there that Māori had five um, particular values that are the cornerstone to everything that is in um, Te Māori or the Māori world. Um, and so my argument was based on um, your previous work was that there's five stages to come to settlement. The fifth stage, you know, we all set on a group of values um, by where we could all live and, you know, that relationality that could happen with one another. But I think also, um, you know, it's not just about relationality to land, it's also relationality to um, difference, say, uh, non-heterosexual people, um, for example, and having a look at how we look around at values and how we implement them within a society. Because my argument is that New Zealand, Aotearoa New Zealand society should be based on these values. Right. Um, besides um, endowing an object or an idea with legal personality is, is, is not that new. Um, corporations have a legal personality and um, they can be constituted, represented, sued, and so on and so forth. Um, so um, drawing from, you know, centering indigenous knowledge and law and sovereignty and centering the environment, um, that, that sort of begs the question, what, what is it going to be, the relationship between uh, these two founding cores of these um, um, a constitutional practice that um, um, that you've been you've been referring to. How do they articulate? How do they relate to each other? Are they overlapping? Are they um, um, right? So yeah. So in the work that um, I've done in this idea of a, constant, um, a collective future moving forward, it's ideas like mana. So mana in this form is sovereignty or indigenous sovereignty, but it also means power and authority in this case. Um, tanga, which is another way of saying relationality, how do we um, relate to one another. Um, tapu, which is sacred, that which is sacred, nor that which is um you know normal or the other um one is um utu and it is an important one and it's always in the colonial sense gets misrepresented um as being you know revenge or vengeance on um, level but you know one of the key things underpinning this conversation uh, from my works is you know the idea that not only do Indigenous people need to take responsibility for their own decolonization, but there's also a pathway and a way forward by where, you know, settler, invader, um, they themselves actually need to take responsibility for their own um, decolonization as well, coming to understand what has taken place on Indigenous land. And I'm heartened by the change in the history curriculum that is taking place in New Zealand starting next year where it will be compulsory for um, students to learn um, an aspect of Indigenous history, which will bring us to a more better understanding. But the reasons why I bring up the two um, history is because they're all intertied to the politics, to the constitutionalism, to the way that we currently are. And one of the things that I note um, in terms of um, settler colonialism is this thing is that we're on a um, seesaw by where 
um, all the ideas that were imported um, are given reference. And what actually needs to take place in order for us to achieve, um, you know, a collective future is, you know, a balancing of that and coming to understand what that balancing means. And that is, you know, protection of the environment, um, upholding Indigenous knowledge, making sure that Indigenous sovereignty um, is valued, understood. You know, there's a whole lot of work, not only in Australia, but, you know, all over in these settler colonial countries where we need to start trying to really understand what each other needs, what each other wants, and how do we truly value um, Indigeneity. So as an example, um, in New Zealand, I can easily argue that Māori are not valued because you're only paid one cent in the dollar for everything that you're owed to by the government. And so there's an idea we can't develop, we can't progress if we aren't actually seen as fully human. And the underlying racism of the government, um, you know, um, creates those problems. For sure, like um, a reminder that historical treaty um, or treaties aren't necessarily um, um, a solution to, to, to all problems relating to, to um, managing the relationship between a settler colonial state and, and indigenous sovereigns. Can you see settler polities, settler states signing a treaty with the environment? At this point, I'd say anything is possible. I mean, we need to understand how much of an impact, um, for example, climate change is going to have because the solutions that Indigenous knowledge um, provides um, is fundamental um, in how we adapt to the oncoming slaughter of climate change. But I don't know. Um, I'd like to see what that looks like. It's an interesting proposition um, and it would move um, some of these conversations forward probably a bit faster. Great. Um, earlier on, you referred to, 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 to a lack of knowledge. You, you referred to um, how and why academics um, are unable to, to, to provide them and to help shaping the instruments that um, can, um, can construe this um, constitutional practice that you, you've been referring to. Um, so, Another million dollar question. Um, how can academics, how can scholarly work help? Um, That's a good question. Um, in terms of Australia, one of the things that hasn't been done is um, having a deep dive look at what the Matiki Mai Aotearoa report might look like in Australia. So adapting some of those ideas and see where we get to. But I'm also mindful that sometimes when that happens, um, you know, they take ideas, but they don't actually involve the thoughts of Indigenous peoples or Indigenous peoples thinking um, on the land that they're importing these ideas to. Um, and so that sometimes can be very problematic. Um, and moving, the conversation forward, you know, we need to be more inclusive of indigeneity, indigenous knowledge. I mean, it's only as recently as last year that, say, the University of Auckland um, had the science Ma Tauranga debate by where a group of professors who all happened to be white um, basically um, said that ma tauranga or indigenous knowledge is not science. Um, and so you have all of these conversations um, and people coming from places of not knowing um, that are problematic. Also, 
if I'm particularly honest in some subject matter, hiring practices, the ability to um, overcome the um, zombie university, the neoliberalism within it, um, the ability to see the need um, to, um, you know, hire Indigenous academics in the first place um, to fill the halls to provide different perspectives. Yeah. Right. Um, and um, and and certainly, you, you, we can point to to, to similar examples um, um, happening in 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 Australian institutions, in Australian universities. Yeah. Uh, um, and I wanted to ask you, you in your work um, and over the years, and in our conversations, including our you know email correspondence and so on, you. Um, you, you, you express a dissatisfaction with the notion of settler colonialism as a particular mode of domination, mm. and you, 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 you know, you came up with a solution. You, you, you are, um, you've been, you've been talking and you've been writing about invader colonialism as a, as a better way of encapsulating a mm. set of relations. And this um, links to the previous um, comments of the previous question um, in the fact that, you know, I'm not criticising Patrick Wolfe or those um, that um, write on settler colonialism. What I'm basically saying is that largely we as Indigenous people have been excluded through multiple mechanisms um, from um, engaging in these conversations. And so the idea of a settler to my people who were uh, militarily invaded um, is somewhat, you know, could be conceived as a, not the word I really want to use, but offensive um, on some level. And the term settler um, denotes a form of um, innocence um, that goes with that. The thing about using the term invader is that it actually um, confronts people about their position within society and that it moves them to actually um, come to understand the reason why I would call them that. They, they understand what that history of me using the term invader is about. And so I've been calling it uh, more recently within my work, Settler Dash invader colonialism. And the reason is, um, it's a concession, because we haven't come to understand what is the most appropriate term there. Is it invader? Is it settler? I generally tend in my work to put them both together with a slash in the middle. Um, and whatever the reader takes from that, that's what they take from it. Um, but you know, um, there's um, value in taking people that come from my Indigenous background, so raised in culture, has language, you know, and um, bringing us into the academy because we challenge those ideas that are normative. Um, and so that's also um, part of it, but also the idea, the construction of settler um, colonialism um, I would always argue that, you know, from my own work, that was it Patrick Wolf um, who wrote about this concept, or was it Pui Wahine in 1850, who wrote a mortete that talks um, and describes settler colonialism, but does it in a very poetic Māori understanding, very academic Māori understanding, but unless you had the um, knowledge, the culture, if you didn't understand the language and the how um, hidden, how formalized, how she wrote it, you'll never actually understand it. Um, and so part of that is since we don't have enough Indigenous political scientists, um, going back into our cultural archives and ripping um, some of these songs, some of these um, things apart and extracting their political theory and philosophy is really important. 
and you know there are spaces um, for uh, deep indigenous scholarship but there's also spaces as well for settler invader scholarship as well it's just where do we draw those lines great um thank you I'm a parakeet. Um, we have time now for, um, for, for, for questions, for answers, for engaging with our um, um, audience. And, uh, and this has been a, a, a wonderful and very productive conversation. And um, I hope we can continue. We will definitely continue. Um, thank you so much, both of you. That was so interesting. Um, I have one question that I want to get in before anyone else, um, because you touched on the question of relationality, Hema Perakey, um, and I and I want to come back to to you were speaking specifically in relation to treaty, um, and this is a very live conversation, um, including a lot of the treaty education we're doing at the moment, sort of recognizing this difference that for for the settler state. The desire with a treaty is often, um, you know, to draw a line to say, you know, okay, we've settled a grievance and we're we're moving on. Um, whereas for First Nations, a treaty is an opportunity to to enter into a into a, a formal relationship that that has um, benefits in terms of recognition and other things. So it's the you know, is it a is it a divorce? Is it a marriage type question? Is is um, is a really live conversation. And of course, the marriage element of it recognizes that, of course, it's a relational process. You know, there is no, there is no drawing a line under the relationship because it is ongoing because of the nature of settler colonialism. So I just wondered if you could say a little bit more about your thinking about how you've come around to the kind of relational thinking in, in your work in regard to treaty. I am so my idea about relationality is that um, despite what some of my relations would like to do, which is to get rid of them, um, you know, is that practical? Could we actually do it? So I basically see the argument that it's probably not never going to happen. And so we actually need to come to understand one another and to actually implement relationality. And within Pacific Indigenous cultures, relationality um, is pretty much everything. Mm. Um, and so that's for Samoa, that's for Tonga, that's for all over the place, Hawaii. Um, but in certain um, parts, instead of it being expressed like in Māori as being whakawhanaungatanga, um, it's, expressed, it's expressed, say, within Tongan culture or within Samoan culture as va. Um, so we all have this understanding that relationality is key and fundamental. How do I relate to you? How do you relate to me? Um, but also understanding that because of the idea of Indigenous sovereignty, um, what I get to speak about is very different to what, say, a settler gets to um, think about. Understanding where those boundaries are. And, you know, um, we have in New Zealand been undertaking biculturalism as a policy framework for about the last 40 years. And a large chunk of that is, had been about implementing the treaty as a, a foundational document and what does that look like in our national politics and all that type of thing. So you won't talk, you won't hear in New Zealand the idea of a marriage, but you will hear a lot about a relationship and so what does that relationship look like um, in terms of, um, you know, Aotearoa New Zealand? Um, there is a set of treaty principles um, that were mainly codified by um, a Court of Appeal decision. Um, and so that's how the government has taken on through those treaty principles. Um, you know, how they should implement treaty, how they should relate to one another. I think what is far more exciting in the Victorian context um, is that it's something that can actually be constructed from scratch. Um, and that helps. You don't have the baggage that we have um, in New Zealand. Um, so, yeah, there's um, a lot 
in the space, and I'm just going to basically say relationality is key. How do we relate to one another? How can we make, in this case, a far more better Victoria, or as this, these treaty conversations um, continue to elsewhere in Australia? They're really important, but also understanding the historical um, things of modern treaties in places like Canada. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm going to hog the floor for another another minute. In the in the in the education that we're we're delivering through the treaty education program at the moment, there's I feel like we break people's hearts um, all the time because they all come in thinking Canada and New Zealand have the answers. Oh. They've done this so well, and then we're like. Mm. <laughs> unpack that a little and um you know it, it, it's confronting because you know you, you're right these ideas circulate in some some fantastic and exciting ways but also some quite problem problematic ways like Cheryl Lightfoot was speaking to another group of students recently and she said look I'm really sorry I'm really sorry that you've taken this idea of like the truth and reconciliation commission we had in Canada and tied it to treaty in the way that you have in Australia like that's not what we meant that's not you know but here it's become this kind of truth that we 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 rest on so um you know i think that these 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 um transnational indigenous conversations are so important but then what often gets taken up domestically is very partial and and bits of that in quite problematic ways i'm sure you see that in atero as well yeah no um, because um, 1975 was when the Waitangi Tribunal um, started out, and so these Truth and Reconciliation Commissions have a history back in Aotearoa, New Zealand, that goes back to 1975. Um, and if you think about the 90s within South Africa, that's quite a significant gap in between um, when they were established in other um, places. But, you know, it's important to recognise that history it's important to recognize what has been done and it's important to move forward in productive ways. I agree. Um, right. A question here that might be the last one we, we get in, um, I'm not sure. Um, you, you did just address partially a, another question that someone had asked about the South African TRC. But there's another question here that says you spoke of, of the seesaw of knowledge and values being tilted towards the, in, the invader slash settler yeah. and how it should be balanced. And the question is they're wondering why it should be balanced rather than perhaps tilted towards Te Ao Māori and Maturanga Māori if we are to achieve decolonisation. <laughs> Um, the reason as to um, why um, I use the seesaw um, is because down this end, this is where we current, currently are, settler colonialism and all those ideas down there. Um, here is um, a form of balance. And the reason why um, I use the concept of balance is from the Māori word taurite, to be in balance. Um, and the reason for that, and in a lot of my work, I purposely... Um, chuck the English out the door and use the Māori word because I'm being purposefully about the type of cultural con um, construct I'm trying to use, is that idea within everything in Te Māori, everything is sits in balance. It sits in balance with each other, it sits in balance with the environment, it sits in balance um, with everything. Should we tilt towards... Um, Kopapa Māori towards Mātauranga Māori, I think we need to take a serious good look at ourselves um, and incorporate that a lot more in that untilting towards um, balance. But then again, it's that idea, for example, I'll use this one. If we were to uh, um, implement eco-constitutionalism and actually gave, give legal personhood to Papa Tuanuku or Earth Mother, that's actually a form of balance. Um, you know, coming to understand where we are, treating um, the environment with um, a lot more respect um, than, you know, um, a dumping ground, you know, or within the um, idea of the Resource Management Act, you know, the planning system in New Zealand is very neoliberal in its makeup. Um, and so as long as you have um title to a piece of land you can basically do anything as long as you get a um, resource consent and you know if your project is of more national um, significance you can bypass the resource consent process and go through the epa so you know um 
there's this, which is down here, and there's moving towards that. I would say to be in balance would increasingly or significantly um, see the um, use or the increase or presence of, you know, indigenous knowledge. That's probably a non-negotiation point. Yeah. And a reminder that, um, you know, the need for balance is a reminder that whether it should be a marriage or a divorce, it should not be a gunshot proposition. Yeah. That's right. I'm going to squeak in one last one, a um, quickish answer probably, um, but a provocative one. Do you think that the Waitangi Tribunal is a tiger with no teeth? This is what they traditionally say. Um, and the thing is, um, with the type of work that I've been producing, um, it could be argued that it is settler colonial in nature. Um, and so when they first brought out the Waitangi Tribunal, it was only to deal with modern issues. And then they backdated it to 1840. But it's actually given no um, teeth in the fact that um, they've taken away ability um, to actually, you know, force the government to say give back blocks of land, um, as an example. Um, and that comes back to um, a guy that was racist named Alan Titford, who blamed Te Rorua for um, a far north iwi um, for burning down his house. They didn't do it. Um, and so they concocted the national government at the time and were federated farmers to produce a um, policy that actually said that, you know, um, private land can't be um, given back um, in that thing. Um, and so there's a whole thing about Alan Titford in the far right in New Zealand. I'm not going there, but yeah, you get the general gist. <laughs> Um, all right. I thank you so much, Hamo Periki. Thank you so much, Lorenzo. What a rich conversation. I mean, an hour just wasn't nearly long enough. Um, so much. I have so many questions that I, I want to ask right now. But we, we will um, wrap up. Thank you both very much for your time, your knowledge, your expertise, and for a rich conversation. Um, we have one more public event in the Australian Centre uh, this year. We have our final critical public conversation of the year coming up on the 26th of October with the wonderful Kevin Bruniel uh, presenting on his latest book. So that's a really exciting one. We're looking forward to rounding out our year with that. Um, in the meantime, if we could um, just say thank you and goodbye to Hema Pareki and Lorenzo. Thank you everyone who's been online today. Um, this was a, a special a special webinar that we put on when we, we learned that Hema Pereki was going to be in Melbourne. It's been wonderful to have you here visiting with us and um, we hope to see more of you very soon. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, team. Um, see you soon. Kia ora.